My name is Kim from Macdon. I'm going to take you around this unit. <clears throat> everybody here, does everybody here have a Macdon? Okay. So Curtis, you got an FD70. Anybody here with FD75s? Anybody here with FD1s? Okay, so we're going to be fairly fairly generic. So what happens since the FD70 through to the FD1 here and then on to the new FD2 that we're going to show you later? The geometry and the working of the header is exactly the same. But it seems like every four years, anything that we would want improved on or whatever they put into the new model. So the, the geometry and the way that things work, work for the FD70 still today is the FD1 is just easier setting and improvements. So if you just come real quick here, all of you have got the same type of configuration, okay, which means your adapter is run separate uh, from your header. And Macdon's whole key to their whole header is there's really no hydraulics and sensors involved. It's all on spring touch control, which makes it work really, really well and float and stuff. But on this center adapter, which does anybody have a new one for this year? FD1. So what you're supposed to do is this oil on the FD70 and FD75 is 1540. On the new FD1, it's trans hydraulic oil. You're supposed to on break in change it at 50 hours and it's 75 liters. Okay, and after that for everybody, it's every thousand hours. The only exception to the rule on that is this filter should have been painted gold. Because in all your units, that's a 10,000 uh, micron filter in there. And it's not when it will, or it's not if it will plug, it's when it'll plug. So after your 50 hour oil change, that needs to get changed every single season. Okay, filter on the other ones, the filters in here, down here, gets changed every season after that first break in. What you're running here is your combine runs your reel. Off your cat, everything else here is run off the PTO into a, into a gearbox here that turns on a chain to your shaft, which runs your center drum. There's a clutch in there. On all the units, there's a clutch in there. Okay, if it ratchets, there's a clutch in there. In here, that chain, you don't access it, so you don't know what it's doing. You can't see if it's loose or not. These two holes right here, you just undo this, and I think, it's been a while, I think it's a 5 16 socket with an extension. You put it on there, you turn it by hand. The sprocket is here, it's underneath the chain. Just tighten it by hand, give it a good thing, and then just back it off a bit. And make sure you look at that and do that a couple times a year, okay? That's a pretty important chain in there because it's running your whole center drum. Plus it's running your hydraulics. Now on the 70 and 75, you had two pumps, one to run the knife and one to run the side drapers and the center feed. And that was an issue. So now on the FD1, they got three pumps, one for the knife, one for the drapers, and one for the center delivery, okay? So that's fairly important. Maintenance on that is 85, 140 gear oil, should change it, but that chain is critical. So two things that you should know on this side is this filter every season and check that chain. Anybody have any questions on here? Have they got common return on the new ones or are they still that kind of one through the other through the other on these older? One through the other through the other. On the ones before, the way it was done before because it was in a separate series, you could get contamination from your upper cross auger and the center drive, we had problems in 2014, and it would bypass the filter and contaminate the block. It's no longer that way on the FD1, okay? On the FD1, uh, seems like you gotta have the oil reservoir right up or, good. and then it foams over. Okay, so good point. So there's a sight glass here on the reservoir. It comes, from the factory supposed to come about right there where the bottom hourglass is pretty much full. This thing has to be sitting level to know it. where it's at. If you've got hills, side hills or hills, you should be filling at least halfway up that second sight glass. And there's no downside to that except if you've got big side hills, you may have product coming out of the filler tube on side hills. So there's a filler tube extension that goes up about this high. Okay, so there's no downside to more oil, except it may come out of the filler tube. 
Okay, and you can buy the filler tube after the fact and just put that extension on there. Okay, on the FD1, for the first time, you can actually shut off your, shut off your upper cross auger. That's a pretty big deal. Okay, this year with the low crops, are you going to be using your upper cross auger nowhere near as much? On those of you that have an FD70 and 75, you can rig up a system to shut off your upper cross auger. You have to remember though, the hoses that go into the motor on the upper cross auger, you take them out, you can't quick coupler them together. You got a, no back pressure. So complete open loop because the oil has to make its circuit. So you can do that, put a T in the line, just make sure there's no back pressure to complete the loop. They've got a shut off <coughs> on these, so that solves that. Any questions? This is, a, this is a pretty big deal that people don't understand. This white mark inboard to out is supposed to be halfway for draper tension. If you feel your drapers are slipping and you want to tighten that further, you're doing absolutely nothing. You're actually making it worse. Okay, halfway is maximum tightness. Now after that, that scissor tightener goes back against itself and it actually starts to loosen off. Okay, so inboard to outboard, 15 16 inch wrench, make sure it's right in the middle. Okay, everybody get that? Pretty simple. Those of you with the FD 70 and 75s that just created my life miserable on our end shields, <laughs> not that way anymore. Come around and you can actually stand in the shade. <laughs> On the 40 foot, 99.9% .9 of the units go out double knife drive. They do have single knife drive, which means drive, drive on both ends. Uh, on this 85, 140 gear oil, this is your dipstick. Okay, should be changed. Thing on this one is you want this belt to be fiddle string tight. Okay, and the reason is it's an untimed knife drive, which means there's a drive on this side and one on that side on a V belt. It's on a V belt, it's not timed. Okay, but you don't ever, if you get in, you get a root in your knife or something, you don't want to spin this belt, because why buy a new belt? This has got an over relief valve in it. If this is tight, it'll just stall out this and it won't spin your belt. Okay, so make sure that belt is always fiddle string tight. Okay, <clears throat> on this for a brand new unit, it's not a bad idea to, to recheck those two bolts and those two bolts after two or three days. Okay. Good thing because there's a lot of play on there. This grease nipple. Most used grease nipple on the entire machine. How often are you supposed to grease that thing? 25 hours. 25 hours. Does everybody use battery operated grease guns? Yeah. Yeah. So what you do is you'll over grease that thing. You're supposed to grease it one to two shots every 25 hours. You over grease it, which a lot of guys do. You push that pitman arm down and you either stall out your knife or you break your knife. It was always interesting to me when I'd go around to dealers and you'd walk in the showroom and you'd see this farmer coming at you because I'm wearing a Macdown shirt. And that knife's a big piece of crap and I break it all the time. And I said, I sure hope you're greasing that thing. Seven to eight shots a day. <laughs> well, that's why you're breaking your knife. <laughs> if you over grease it, it's pushing that pitman arm down, just undo the grease nipple, pop it back up, push the grease out. Don't push that pitman arm down. Okay? Pretty clear here what has to happen. Real easy adjustment to tighten it. Tighteners on the back. Okay? Let's come this way. If I'm going too fast, just stop me. On every MacDon header, the first Four guards are different, okay? They got a different number on them. The, the suffix on these is 45. From here, they're 44 all the way for, forward. Do we know what the difference is between these two guards? Anybody know? Yep, there's a shol they're shoulderless here. And why are they shoulderless? It's because the knife goes like this, right? So it needs that play in it to go here. Can you stick a shouldered guard in there? Absolutely, if that knife's in the right spot and you're not paying attention, you can. And boy, this header chatters and bangs and busts the knife and all kinds of problems. If you don't, 
have a shoulderless guard to put here, just take a regular guard with an angle grinder and grind off the shoulder on the top. Okay, fixes that up. On here, and this is a no-brainer, but it wasn't for me. I farmed 18 years and never just cussed out my machine when it wasn't cutting right. Nine times out of ten, when you're not cutting right, it's because your holds downs. Okay, your hold downs have to hold that knife down to cut on the bottom of the guard. Which means once the paint wears off of this, to slide in, a business card is the most clearance you're supposed to have there. Okay, if you don't check your hold downs at the beginning of the year, that's on you. Okay, really simple to adjust. Get your hold downs in shape and they'll last you for the year and you'll cut a million times better. Okay, the most important guard on a double knife drive is this guard right here. Uh, Tim, can you, everybody keep your fingers off. Tim, can you just turn that belt a bit, just reef it so I can get my sickle section closer here? Uh, the other way, sorry. You Keep would, going. You would want that, wouldn't you? Come on, skinny. Just a hit. That's good. Okay, this is the most important guard on a double knife drive. Okay, if this isn't set properly, you're not going to cut properly. Which means, does everybody have a feeler gauge in their shop? Four to sixteen thou clearance on the front. Double that on the back, which means it's got to be towed down. Okay, if you're ever replacing guards and you don't set that, you're not going to cut like you're supposed to. So it's it's. It's double the clearance on the back is on the front and you want it pretty much touching on the front and double on the back. Okay, pretty clear. Those things, as I skip them, but if you pay attention to that, you're cutting guys. <laughs> you got to cut first before you combine. And if you pay attention to those, you'll cut better. On here, there's three grease nipples. One here, this thing should be turned around. These two are in a slider shaft. Like that, and here's your U-joint. Those got to be greased all the time because even though you're not using your upper cross auger, that's what helps your wing flex. Okay, if you don't grease them, guaranteed 100% they'll seize. And when they seize, you no longer have any flex in your header. So grease those grease nipples. There, there, we turned it there. Am I going too fast? Okay, chain tensioner. I got this stick for a reason. Chain tensioner. On the FD70 and 75, it's just a nut there. And the nut is on a slider with two serrated washers on it and the sprocket sits on top of the chain. Now it's got a cover on it and you can't see if that chain is looser or not. What you do is you grab your finger, take a white marker, draw a line right there and grab the finger and you should have no more deflection than a quarter of an inch either way. Okay, if it's further than that, your chain's starting to get loose. You don't have to take the cover off, you don't have to do anything. Check your deflection in your drum. Anybody ever here ever had to change that chain? Yeah. Isn't that fun? Same, that's the same engineer that yeah. Yeah. But isn't that fun? Yeah. So so don't don't go there. Okay? Check your chain. If you check your chain the problem on the FD70 and the 75 is because that sprocket is on top of the chain is every time you reverse your machine, it wants to drive that chain up. And if it's only held by serrated washers on a slider, it will drive it up. And the problem is with that is when you take your 15 16 inch wrench and loosen that off, you can do that without getting in there, but don't loosen it off any more than half to three quarters of a turn. Then you reset your wrench on the top and you tap it down with a dead blow till you got very little deflection in your drum and then tighten it up to 275 pounds Norwegian tight. Okay, that's tight. <laughs> okay, you all get that? Now on the FD1s, they finally listened and put a positive adjustment in there so that you're just screwing down, you're loosening off the bolt and screwing it down and then tighten it back up again. You don't have to frig that way, so make sure but it's still got the same clearance, like the same stock box. Exactly. Yeah, it's just easier to do. On the FD1s, you'll see on both sides, you got a white indicator, and you got a B on the bottom and an A on the top. Anybody know what that's for? What that does, it comes standard in B. So B, that drum will be exactly like your FD70 and 75. If you undo 
the two bolts on either side and move that indicator up to A. It extends the fingers at the top to give you more grab, okay, for peas and straight cut canola. And it makes quite a bit of difference. But make sure you do both sides if you're going to do it. And then my suggestion is, is when you're not doing peas or canola, put it back to B. The reason is, if it's on A with that extended reach, it has a tendency to wrap when you're doing your wheat, barley, whatever you're doing. Okay, any questions on that? Are they what? Yes. So what happens is these fingers start to uh, extend at the top when they're coming around. Moving that to A will extend them further to give them reach up there. When you reverse with this thing, the fingers, there's a cam in there that flips over and your fingers actually extend on the back side to pull the crop out. If you have, and I suggest you get that in-cab draper speed, because when you reverse it, turn off your side drapers so that when you feed it back in again, you're not feeding all this crop in to plug it up again. Okay, turn it off. Okay. Bottom pan under here, does everybody clean that out every day? You better. You should. Because I guarantee you when you clean it out, you've got tiny little rocks, pebbles under there, lots of dirt. And if you just want to create more wear and tear in your center draper, just don't ever clean it out. <laughs> that sounded like a smart ass, but I'm serious. Okay, it's just like pissing into the wind, guys. You don't want to piss into the wind. Just make sure that the wind's coming at you from this direction when you drop that, so all the dust goes that way. It's that simple. It takes 10 seconds to pull the... Flip the lever, drop it, and pop it back up again. Drop your center pan. Any questions? We've gone to, on the FD1, we've gone to four inch spacing on the fingers. It'll really show up this year with a lighter crop. Okay, much better. What's that? <laughs> no, duck feet helps sometimes in here. But that's the only answer is, is the duck feet in there for a really, really light crop on the six inch spacing. But. Okay, any questions? One thing, and I want to point this out, that's the reason why I raised this. If I stand sideways, can you guys still see me? Okay, so I've got a little bit of weight. I'm going to find the easy way to do things. Okay, your deck seal is absolutely critical as your machine gets older. Okay, what happens, the edge of your draper is gonna start to wear. Okay, because it's running on it underneath the deck seal, and it will. Okay, not the first year, but maybe the second year. And when it wears, dirt and everything gets in under there, just creates all kinds of havoc. Will wreck your drapers, will wreck your rollers, will wreck everything. So how do you, how do, you do it easy? So what I did, is I loosened off the canvas, 15 turns, made sure your splice is here, grab a pliers, pick it up, put a two by four up under here, and you have got five, got one, two, three, four, five knuckles. Okay, so what you're gonna do, Curtis, on yours, if yours is older, you're gonna find an Allen wrench that matches the thickness of your draper. So you're going to match up an Allen wrench for the thickness of your draper, okay? And what you're going to do, find the Allen wrench and lay it flat, okay? That should be nice and tight the way it is. You're matching up there. You take a three quarter inch wrench on each one of these knuckles and you undo the bolts and right on the knuckle you take a punch and a hammer and you tap the knuckle. And when you do that, this bed comes up. Well, how are you going to know that it's right? Well, what happens is when that bed comes up, it pushes the Allen wrench like that. You put a pry bar, pry, a pry bar there, bend it down so your Allen wrench sits nice and snug, and tighten it up. It's that simple. Then you know that your deck seal is set properly. <clears throat> the old way of doing it was take your draper off, try and adjust all those. You put your draper back on, and it was too tight, too loose, and you have to do it again and again and again and again. Let's be smarter. Does everybody get that? Like that makes sense to everybody? Um, I think I got this covered. 
Uh, Ryan, yep. I'll get you to, if everybody can move away, Ryan, I'll get you to lower it down to about six, eight inches off the ground. Make sure your tilt's at B and a half and lower the reel all the way to the bottom, please. Uh, we gotta lift the reel. Yep. Yep. Hey, yeah, gra it grab it. Let's close it. How come the honeybee got to where you're not heavy? There. I'll explain it here in a second. Okay, you should ask me what I just did there. What did I just do? Middle, middle. Middle, middle, middle. You're right. So what happens with a Macdon, because it's on springs, you're looking to set it for float and wing balance for middle, 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 middle. So what happens is we put it roughly six to 10 inches off the ground. We put our reel to the middle and we tilted it to be in a half. So that we know that when you're cutting on the ground or whether you're 12 inch double height cutting, which you won't be this year probably, but that everything's set for every condition. We found that the way we set it, when you go middle, 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 it's perfect for every condition. Does that make sense? Okay. Just before we go around to that, this sets your real time angle, comes at two. Anybody explain to me what this real time angle is all about? The higher the number, the more aggressive. Okay, if you're straight cutting canola, you should probably be in number one, because you're just brushing it. If you've got lodged crop or peas right down the ground, and you've got to extend your reel out, number four. Number four, with your reel all the way out, will pick below the cutter bar. Okay, now I'm not saying between us and the competition over there, I'm saying between us and everybody, everybody else is using a flexible cutter bar, which means the closest you can have your reel to the cutter bar is six inches, maybe eight inches. On a Macdon, it's three quarters of an inch. So you won't snip tines and you can pick lower than your cutter bar. Okay, and you won't snip tines, and that's just the way it is. I have to tell the truth because Devin's got me mic'd up, so I can't tell you a story. Okay, that's the way it is. So what happens if you've got lodge crop or need to be a little more aggressive, just take your three quarter inch wrench, turn that counterclockwise, spin your reel, set it in. If you don't know what it is you want, set this side first because it's the easiest. If you like number three, then go to the middle and set the other three at one at number three. Make sense? Let's keep going guys, we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of this thing now. Come on guys, I'm serious, this is, this is important. So do, does anybody here in this group able to explain to me how this header works on float and wing balance? Can somebody tell me how it actually works? <laughs> so what happens? Since this thing is on springs, and I'm not kidding you, Aggression. the setting that we make Aggression. on it literally acts like throwing a blanket on the ground and floating it across. Anybody believe me on that? No, not at all. Okay, so what happens, if you understand the settings, what we can do here, you won't push dirt, you won't bust guards, you won't break knife sections, and you'll pick up far fewer rocks. Can't ever guarantee that you're not going to pick up a rock. What's your cell phone number? <laughs> guarantee, and I'm going to show you how we do it. Okay, so we set this thing to middle, 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 right? The downside to an FD70, it never had this wrench. An FD75 and the new FD1 has this wrench. This is everything. We went middle, middle, middle. Okay, then we're going to, so nobody leaning on it. I hit that, those bolts there. What's that number? Two and just a touch. So what that means is that's the pressure it takes to lift that thing off the ground to make it float. If that number is heavier than that, your header's too heavy. If your number is below two, that thing's gonna to wanna to bounce on you. Now, how on earth are you gonna set this if it's too light or too heavy? 
those two spring adjustments right there. If I lowered this thing down, and she was number three, that's too heavy, right? Take inch and three sixteenths, or 32 millimeter socket, and do four revolutions. You're gonna tighten it up to make it lighter, right? Loosen it off to make it heavier. Is Both it, sides, you can do one side at a time. What, do this side, then do that side, and you don't have to come back to this side. So one side at a time. So is that hard to understand? Okay, I, I need guys to go like this. It's not hard to understand, okay? Which means, so which means that middle, 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 you set your header middle, middle, middle on a System 75 and an FD1 and then go like that, okay? It's that simple. Now, Curtis, on yours, to get yours right, they said 75, 70 pounds of lift pressure on the end. Well, 75 pounds, 70 pounds to me is like 200 to you. So you can't, it's so much guesswork. So what I do on an FD70 is I tighten those up four, six turns, and I take off across the lawn in my yard of a thing until I can get the header to bounce. When it bounces, you turn it off. Okay, so you have that. Yeah. What happens if you can get that on two, that's really a more level type of Yeah. On two on on number two is the gospel. Two and a touch. What if that still seems too heavy? It's not. Um, it it will be if your wing balance is out. Okay, well, we're getting into that. Okay? So do you guys understand that what we're doing? We're doing our float, like pulling a blanket. Okay, Macdon works on a touch, which means if we're cutting on the ground, we're working on the entire poly cutter bar is your touch point. Okay, so this thing set at two, two and a quarter is supposed to float along the ground without pushing dirt, without digging in the whole nine yards. Does that make sense? If it's too heavy, it's gonna wanna dig and push dirt. So if you take that blanket and you put six skid shoes underneath it, what's dragging on the ground? Your touch points have gone from 40 feet to about a foot and a half total, okay? So what that means is you shouldn't use your skid shoes except if you have rocks that you don't want to pick up, put your skid shoes down one notch. What are you running your adapter or compressor on to do that? Yeah, we're getting there. Good question, we're getting there. Okay, so skid shoes down if you've got rocks. Other than that, you shouldn't be using your skid shoes. Except that, in stubble height cutting without contour buddies, this now is your touch point. Not your cutter bar, this is your touch point for stubble height cutting, okay? So when you're stubble height cutting and you have rolling land, I would suggest you lower your skid shoes to the bottom. This year when the stubble's lower, maybe halfway, is a touch point on the front end before this interacts. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I, I need nods if it makes sense. Okay. So we set our float to two, two and a quarter. And Kim from Macdon said that's near perfect. So it is. But it means absolutely nothing <laughs> if you don't use auto header height control. Okay. And that's that dial that goes from zero to four. Okay. Which means you need to calibrate your header all the way to the top, all the way to the bottom, all the way to the top, down. You need to set your header down, pressure on the ground, till that dial comes to two and a half. And then, Tim, you kick in what button? Auto header height, when it comes to two and a half, what button do you push? On a new... Return to cut? Press and hold, say that loud. Header resume button, and you're locked in. Which means, as you're combining, Which means setting the float on your header means only 30% of the way there. What happens is when you set your auto header height at two and a half, which is the middle between zero and four, you've then told your feeder house and your header that you want this exact pressure based on number two, two and a quarter, the two and a half on there to be exactly like a blanket goes across the field. When you're combining, and I don't care if your field is table flat, 
that dial's going like this all the time. And it should be, right? Because your land is a little bit different. Okay, so what that does is you're coming to a hill, that number should climb to four. The minute it goes past getting close to three, it immediately interact with your feeder house to lift so that same blanket-like pressure is on the ground, okay? When you're coming over a hill, do you want your header to drop right away? Absolutely you do. And that's why you gotta calibrate your feeder house to that and set it to enough. And it'll follow the ground perfectly, but if you don't have your float set right, and you don't have your auto header height set, it won't do that. Does, does anybody wanna argue with me? No, does anybody wanna disagree with me? <laughs> It's gospel. Okay, now the only other thing, and this is where everybody gets confused, and this is where I need Wyatt, is your, is your wing balance, which means it just confuses the living slats out of everybody. Our wings are on a bell crank, okay? And that means your axis point is exactly like that. So if I was standing like this, and this is the wing of my header, okay? And my axis point is right there, is my wing balanced. It's perfectly balanced. Now, does perfectly balanced good? Okay, you think about this. If it's perfectly balanced and you're coming along and you got a bit of a hill here and the header is easily able to go up because it's perfectly balanced, right? Goes up. What about if you're coming to the crown of a hill where their header has to go down. What's making it go down? Just, just the weight of the crop, and is that enough? This year it may not be enough. So what I'm saying is perfectly balanced. This year is maybe not perfect. What we wanna do is make your header frown just a touch, right? Because then with crop on it, it's gonna to wanna to go down. You will not, who said before about the ends? Were you telling me about the ends? That'll make it so your ends don't dig in. That'll make it sure that it falls down and goes up at perfect rate. Now it's as simple as why and I need you and the only reason is. Exactly. Be okay, because. No, no, we're gonna go through that now, but that's a, that's a fair question. What I'm saying is I don't want it to smile. And why don't I want it to smile? because it takes way more effort to have the header go down than to go up. Does that make sense? Okay, I believe that. Okay, so, so perfectly level is okay-ish. A hair of a frown or a little less weight on there to go frown is better than a smile, okay? So Wyatt, I'm gonna get you to push that. So here's your bell crank and you guys are actually gonna wanna get in here. Either that or you don't care. <laughs> Okay, I want Wyatt to push up on this bell crank. Nice and easy. Okay, bring it down to level again. Okay, push up nice and slow, all the way up. So I'm at about two and a half. When I'm pushing up on that bell crank, I'm making the header smile. So it's gonna take more force to make it smile than to make it frown. Okay, now with it, just bring it to level first, just a hair down, and then pull down. Okay, go back up again to the middle. Good, bring it down again. Okay, so that was a little bit more to make it frown. So, so we'd wanna change that just a hair. So pull it down a bit. It's as simple as that bolt right there is in the middle of your access point. If you wanna come and have a look at it, come and have a look at it. So it's sitting right there right now. And what I would do is I would take a white marker and mark across the top of that half moon. You loosen off three quarter inch wrench this nut, you just loosen it, it's a carriage bolt, and you loosen off the big jam nut on the inside, okay? And you would move your access point about that much to make your, to make your header balanced. Let's say you move it the wrong way. Does that matter? You've already drawn your half moon circle. <laughs> So you would just take it back the other way. Because I guarantee you, I've done this 3,000 times. And if I don't have the white mark on there, I'll invariably 50% of the time move it the wrong way. 
Okay. Draw your access point and then draw your, you want it to drop, I think you're moving it this way. But it doesn't matter which way you do it, as long as you've got your starting point and you find out, and, and you don't necessarily want to move it so much that your header slumps in a frown. What I always do after I move that, I go and jump on the end and jump up and down like Tim's doing there and see where this settles, okay? This is perfectly balanced. Did I say we want it perfectly balanced? Ideally, we want it down just a hair, ideally. And when you have your covers off, Curtis, it don't matter if you, oh, you've got a wrench, but if you didn't have a wrench, okay, we want it to go down just a hair. Now, that doesn't mean if you've got it perfect, when you pull up at the end of the field and the header's like this, is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. It's like this, is that okay? Yeah, because you may have more dirt on one side than the other side, this and that. You just know by your bell cranks how that's working. I'm just, if you understand wing balance, okay, and what you're doing and float and otter header height, it'll be the best header you've ever used bar none. Does everybody get that? Okay, I got a 70. And yeah. Those two big inch and a five sixteenths, no, they're bigger than that. Yeah. They come loose. And we've been playing, you know, under the covers. And we've been playing and playing. Yeah, you got a problem. And it's called parallelism. Ever since after that, they made it so these nuts had a, a fold over on them and a fold over and a fold over so you don't touch them. Because what happens is you have to go to a cement pad that's perfectly level, okay, and you have to set these in conjunction with this. And it's a, I'm not saying it's a long thing, but they don't explain it in the owner's manual. You need a service manual to get your parallelism back. Because you can't balance your wings if, if that's been moved or frigged with. Yep, yep. Okay, so it's an easy process as long as you've got a perfectly level thing. It's an easy process. But you have to understand the float and the wing balance to be able to do it. Okay, fair enough? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> any questions? Did I leave anything out? So between all the maintenance stuff I went, does everybody here understand your flotation? Which means your number two down here. Does everybody, two, two and a quarter, does everybody understand that? So there should be no questions. Does everybody understand what you're looking to achieve with your wing balance? Okay, it's never more critical than this year <laughs> for float and wing balance and auto header height. And everybody understands what they need to do with their auto header height. And if you understand that, you should not ever have to have a product support guy or anybody come out. You should be able to set your header the way you like it. Okay, I'm a fan, whoever buys a new FD1, or it doesn't matter this year, as long as this is close, because after two or three days, you're probably gonna to have to fine tune it because everything breaks in. Once that's done, you should never have to touch anything again. And so what I like to do the first two or three or four days is combine with the cover off because you can't necessarily see what's going on with dust and in the crop and stuff, what your wings are doing, what everything's doing, but you can sure tell on your wing balance, on your bell crank, you can tell. Guys don't like to leave the covers off because it all fills up with chaff. Whatever, put them back on after. This bar right here, this is perfectly balanced, needs to be right at that nut right there. Now don't rely on that, because when you're greasing, can you step on that thing? Boy, it's no longer there, is it? Okay. So learn to trust. Questions? I'm gonna chime in one little thing here, Kim. Yep. When you guys are working with your float, the sensitivity of your combine works in conjunction with that float. So if you're finding that your gauge goes all the way over to four before and, and uh, doesn't move fast enough, increase the sensitivity of the combine monitor. That will make it react a little bit faster so you're not going to push as much dirt because you can have the flotation set perfect on this header, but if it's not, if the uh, electronics in your combine aren't set right, it yep. is going to plow as well. So you got to make sure the two work together. 
Okay. This time I was paying attention, Kim. Sorry. It's all good. <laughs> now you now you can stand there and you say, okay, Kim was being a bit of a smart ass today. Well, I do that so you listen. But do I know what I'm talking about? When I came out in 2013 with MacDon, they had no territory managers. Every MacDon I saw in the field, I stopped. When a MacDon truck drives into the field, when a guy's got a MacDon header, he stops his combine. And usually lifts his header off the ground. I walk by and I stick my hand underneath the skid shoes and just about blister the crap out of my hand. And I'd get, yep, I'd get up in the cab and I'd say, hi, I'm Kim from MacDon. How's your header working? Best header that was ever made. I said, great. I said, do you feel like you're pushing dirt sometimes? Well, yeah, a little bit. I'm bringing in a bunch of dirt. And you picking up rocks? Well, yeah, I'm picking up rocks. And are you breaking guards and nice sections? Well, yeah, a little bit, but boy, it's a good header. Will you give me 15 minutes? Yeah, set it. And they go, like, are you freaking kidding me? But it's that simple. It's that simple if you understand the concept. Okay. On the back of my truck there, I put whole bunch of uh, cheater sheets or a clinic guide. Guys, take one because what it does, instead of going through your manual, it gives a real quick maintenance points and all that stuff. So grab it. I got all kinds of them. Did I miss anything? You've done these clinics with me before. Did I miss anything? No, you, you did good, Kim. Okay. So, so if you're interested, because we're showing it, we're just going to go over to the FD2 and I'll explain a few things on the FD2. Thanks, guys.